Huge thanks to Rode and Ironside for sponsoring this video, and History with Hilbert for collaborating with me. He'll actually be narrating some of this video. Be sure to check out his channel, the links to which are in the description below. When a modern audience sees 18th century warfare in film or television, such as in The Patriot, the question that first comes to mind is, why are they just standing in lines and firing back and forth? And while they really should be asking themselves, why am I even watching The Patriot? The first question is still a valid one. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian, and today we're going to be discussing infantry formations in the 18th and 19th centuries, and why they were employed. But first, a word from our sponsor, Ironside. Ironside is a computer company that specializes in making high-end gaming computers at an affordable price. They actually sent me their Nemesis model, as seen here. If you've ever seen one of my live streams, you'll know that I have a lot of trouble even running my animation software, much less video games. But from now on, I expect that lag will be no problem at all, which will make the video making process a much smoother one. You can get your own Ironside computer by visiting their website, ironsidecomputers.com, starting at $14.99 and be sure to use my promo code HISTORY for 5% off. Now on to the video. Make ready, present, fire! In order to understand why soldiers fought in lines, it also must be understood how line formations and tactics were even developed. And for this, we have to go back to the early 17th century. The man primarily responsible for the widespread introduction of linear formations in Europe was Gustavus Adolphus II, King of Sweden during this period. Up until that time, infantry was deployed on the battlefield in large square columns of pikemen and musketeers, which allowed them to move around the battlefield as one unit and provide equal protection to each flank. Inspired by a system developed by the Dutch nobleman Maurice of Nassau, Gustavus implemented formations designed to maximize firepower. As stated by David Gates in his book Warfare in the 19th Century, Shallow, linear formations were clearly more advantageous than deep, columnar ones when it came to maximizing the number of troops who could see and thus shoot a given target. As a result, the Swedish army was highly successful in the Thirty Years' War. While Gustavus's system worked, it was not flawless. In the words of Professor Archer Jones, author of The Art of War in the Western World, Gustavus's scheme had one important drawback, its lack of all-round protection provided by the formations based on the square. A line that could only face one direction meant vulnerable flanks and an assailable rear. This, however, would be remedied by the introduction of the bayonet, a short blade that could be attached to the end of a firearm, which allowed infantrymen to fend off cavalry charges without pikes. Bayonets were probably invented early in the 1600s, but did not become widespread until the 1670s. Although at first they had to be inserted into the barrel of a firearm, this was solved by the invention of the socket bayonet, which allowed a musket to be fired with the bayonet attached. Combined with the development of lighter, more efficient muskets, a company of infantry could protect itself from almost anything. Although soldiers were better equipped than they had ever been, it was still more efficient to fight in line formations. This was for a number of reasons. First and most importantly, the only way for infantry to repel cavalry charges was by staying in formation. When infantry was not in formation, they were especially vulnerable, as this meant that each man's flanks would be unprotected and exposed to cavalry. Second, it was easier to maneuver large numbers of men in a rigid formation, as otherwise they would have been separated and disoriented, especially in the smoky environment on the battlefield, making them an even better target for cavalry or enemy infantry. Third, as muskets were very inaccurate, the only way for soldiers to inflict damage on their opponent was by concentrating all of their fire on one target. Combat in this era was more about intimidating the enemy and forcing him to retreat from the battlefield, and this was often accomplished by bayonet and cavalry charges. These points were recognized by military theorists and generals in the 19th and 18th centuries, and as a result, linear formations were used for over 200 years, and this was doubly insured by the technologies of the time. Again, quoting David Gates, At the end of the 1700s, many of the features of ancient warfare still seemed to be present. Smooth war guns had neither much more accuracy nor reach than the slings, bows, and ballistae that they superseded. Well, for close fighting, manual weapons, swords, bayonets, and lances were commonly relied upon. 
That said, linear tactics were continuously being improved upon, with various drills being developed in order to increase rate of fire and survivability. For example, the infantry square, which solved the fundamental problem of linear formations, the vulnerability of their flanks to cavalry charges. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British used the square formation to great effect, most notably at the Battle of Waterloo, where companies of British infantry broke multiple French cavalry charges by forming square. Another significant innovation was the development of light infantry, who were trained to spread out and conceal themselves in order to harass the enemy and screen the primary battle formations while remaining safe from cavalry. Despite these developments, it became clear that linear formations would eventually become obsolete with the development of more accurate firearms in the 19th century. In the American Civil War, for instance, one of the reasons for increased lethality of combat was the use of static line formations against highly accurate and deadly munitions, such as the mini-ball. These new weapons could also disrupt cavalry charges at long distance, which diminished the use of both massed infantry formations and cavalry alike. Regardless, lines continued to be used in some capacity up until the First World War. Despite the prolific casualties suffered by units in close order formations during the start of the First World War, it should still be understood how effective line formations were in their heyday, because as we've previously stated, they proved to be a major deterrent against cavalry, kept much needed order and discipline within the ranks of the thousands of soldiers on the battlefield, and allowed armies to channel a high volume of fire into the formations of their enemy. In spite of all of these points, linear tactics eventually succumbed to the inevitable obsolescence of any method or technology. And speaking of technology, I want to give a big thank you to our other sponsor, Rode Microphones, for providing us with the Video Mic Pro. We've used Rode Microphones for recording since the very beginning of our channel. We highly recommend you check them out. And before you forget, please check out Ironside as well. Their computers and laptops are very easy to set up and can run even the most demanding games without a problem. The level of customization is second to none, and you can design your own computer using their website, which boasts a wide array of PC parts. What's more, if you find a part that isn't on the site, you can get it custom ordered through Ironside. Once again, my promo code HISTORY gets you 5% off of your purchase, and be on the lookout for Ironside's limited time offers on PCs. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank my general staff on Patreon. Fritz, Joe Crispin, Brandon Wuwan, Derek Bello, Jake Hart, PJ Nave, Eric Greenwood, Patrick Reardon, John Graham, James Thompson, Jim Talbot, Dimitri Stillerman, Yannick Schwerdfeger, Christopher Cliff, and everyone else listed on screen. I'd also like to thank our team, David Mianyar, Hert Boss, and Alexander Blake for making this video possible. I'll see you next time with why the American Civil War was so bloody.